Let's develop planar kinematic equations for pursuer target engagement. You can program these equations to get a simulation to describe pursuer target intercept behaviors governed by proportional navigation. This simulation framework will also be useful for the analysis of other guidance laws. This is Missile Guidance Fundamentals, Section 3, Module 2. Here's the homing loop from last time. We want to understand proportional navigation without the complexities of the other systems in the loop. So first we're going to simplify and set the seeker, filter, autopilot, and pursuer to identity. So ultimately, all we're looking at in the homing loop is the relationship between the kinematics and the proportional navigation law. The kinematics becomes the process, the pronav becomes the feedback control law, the target is a disturbance, and a measure of merit is missed distance evaluated at some final time. Okay, let's illustrate this engagement. Here's our inertial frame, our target, target velocity, its heading reference to the inertial frame. The target can accelerate. Note that it's perpendicular to VT so that VT changes direction, but not magnitude. You can also attach a frame to the target. And then we have our pursuer, relative position to the target, reference to the inertial frame. We have the line of sight angle, pursuer velocity, and then a lead angle that causes a collision triangle, assuming the target does not maneuver. That is, its heading is constant. It could be that the target accelerates or that there's a heading error in the pursuer. So we need some acceleration correction. Pure proportional navigation was one option. It's perpendicular to VP. You can attach a frame to the pursuer to describe pure pronav. And then there was true pronav, which is perpendicular to the range vector. And if needed, we could also attach a coordinate system to that to describe it with the kinematics. Here's a list of variables for the previous engagement for reference. Let's review our notation. Here's a variable that is resolved in the inertial coordinate system indicated by the superscript i. The subscript indicates that it's the x component of the target velocity vector. The x component with the subscript x, target quantity with the subscript t. It's not a vector quantity. We know that by the subscript x, but also because it doesn't have a superscript arrow above it. Angular velocity vector is denoted omega. The subscript means angular velocity of target frame with respect to the inertial frame. When we take a derivative of a vector, we need to specify which frame that derivative is taken in. That's indicated with a superscript on the left-hand side of the derivative. And we'll be transforming between one coordinate system to another. So post multiplying C by a variable resolved in the inertial coordinate system gives that variable resolved in the target coordinate system. All right, let's begin our derivation of the kinematics. And keep in mind that this is done in the inertial frame. We simulate with our quantities resolved in the inertial coordinate system. First, let's start with a target. It has its own target carried frame and coordinate system where the velocity of the target is aligned at the I direction and the target acceleration is aligned with the K direction. And the first thing we want is the acceleration of the target taken with respect to the inertial frame. For this, we'll use the vector derivative. On the right hand side, there's two components. The first component deals with the change in magnitude of the target velocity. The second is the change in orientation of the target velocity according to how FT rotates with respect to FI. We specified that VT was constant. So immediately the first term is zero and we just have to evaluate the cross product. For this we use the determinant formula, leaving acceleration resolved out the K direction the target evasive acceleration is simply the time rate of change of its heading angle multiplied by the x component of the target velocity vector, or beta dot times vt. OK, 
Continuing on, let's transform the target velocity vector resolved in the target coordinate system into the inertial coordinate system. For that, we use the direction cosine matrix. Here it is broken out. And so evaluating that, we have two simple equations relating the velocity of the target resolved in the target coordinate system into the inertial coordinate system through the heading angle beta. And then the time rate of change of the range resolved in the inertial coordinate system is simply equal to the target velocity components also resolved in the inertial coordinate system. Now we can do a similar thing for target acceleration where we have target acceleration resolved in the target coordinate system and then transforming again into the inertial coordinate system that's related to the time rate of change of the velocity resolved in the inertial coordinate system. So the equations in the blocks are part of our kinematics resolved in the inertial coordinate system. On to the kinematics of the pursuer. We follow a similar approach and transform the pursuer acceleration into the inertial coordinate system through a direction cosine matrix depending on the line of sight angle lambda. And then again, the time rate of change of the position is equal to the velocity, and the time rate of change of the velocity is equal to the acceleration. And these variables are all resolved in the inertial coordinate system. When we make the DCM as a function of lambda in this context, we're using true proportional navigation. If you implement pure proportional navigation, that transformation of the acceleration on the left-hand side needs to be updated. Now we'll also need relative position and velocity. Here's the position vector to the pursuer, to the target, and the relative position vector between them. Head to tail construction allows us to determine the relative position vector simply from the subtraction of the target position from the pursuer position. And a similar relationship follows for relative velocity. From relative velocity, we can calculate closing velocity. Closing velocity is defined as minus the time rate of change of the range. The range is the magnitude of the relative position vector, where the relative position vector has two components, an x and a z. So we look to take the time derivative of the square root of the sum of the squares of the individual relative position vector components. From the chain rule, we get an expression for closing velocity that depends on the relative position and velocity vector elements. We need line of sight angle, we need line of sight rate. Here's line of sight angle. Clearly it's the tangent of the z component of the relative position over the x component, and so we can solve with the inverse tangent and we have our expression for line of sight angle. What about the rate? Well, you take the time derivative of the inverse tangent expression. With the chain rule, we get the line of sight rate as a function of the components of the relative position and relative velocity vectors. Finally, we need to relate lead angle and heading error. Connecting the velocity vectors from the original engagement diagram, we see the angles of a triangle for lead angle, heading error, target heading angle, and line of sight angle. The law of signs allows us to relate those angles, and then we can solve for lead angle. Lead angle is a function of beta, lambda, velocity ratio, and heading error. Compare this expression to the collision triangle expression developed in section one, module two. We have the geometry and the kinematics to simulate the engagement. So to start, we specify engagement conditions and parameters. For the pursuer, this means the lead angle, its heading error, the pursuer position in the inertial coordinate system and pursuer velocity magnitude. For the target, target heading, target acceleration, target position in the inertial coordinate system and target velocity magnitude, as well as the navigation constant n for the pronav law. From these inputs, we determine the initial conditions for the kinematic equations of motion. It's nine states. There's a heading angle of the target and then the remaining eight states are the inertial positions and the inertial velocities of the target and pursuer. And from those kinematic states, 
we compute the pronav input at the current time step. So for true pronav, it's lambda dot and vc. With those pronav inputs, we compute the pronav command. The pronav command is substituted into the kinematics appropriately. And the kinematics are advanced forward through numerical integration one time step. That produces the next kinematic state at ti plus 1. The pronav input is computed again. And the process continues through numerical integration over a number of time steps to a final time. And the simulation is finished. Let's summarize some key equations. To define the kinematics initial condition, we transform the velocity of the pursuer and the velocity of the target in their respective coordinate systems to the inertial coordinate system, just simply through direction cosine matrix transformation. The first block in the numerical integration block was computing the true pronav input. That's closing velocity and line of sight rate. And these are determined from the kinematic state vector. And then taking the true pronav inputs, vc and lambda dot, substitute into the true pronav law. The true pronav command is perpendicular to the line of sight direction. And that's resolved in the inertial coordinate system for implementation in the kinematic equations. But it's important to note that our pursuer cannot just arbitrarily achieve acceleration in any direction. There is a maneuver plane for the pursuer. So summarizing our kinematic state equations, we have the beta dot, the r dot, and the v dot equations. And in particular, the v dot equations on the bottom right assumes that the pursuer can perfectly achieve the pronav command in the AP true directions resolved in the inertial coordinate system. Now being mindful of the maneuver limitations of the pursuer, Again, our true pronav law. We put a coordinate system aligned along the line of sight direction and with the k direction along AP true. And now we can resolve the true pronav command as a vector with AP true in the k direction. And then our pursuer and our body aligned pursuer coordinate system with its maneuver direction in the k direction, we can project AP true onto the body coordinate system and use just a direction cosine matrix to do that, getting AZ, the K component of AP true resolved in the pursuer frame, what can actually be achieved by our pursuer. Again, our kinematic state equations, but the bottom right equations now involve a direction cosine matrix that transforms the pursuer into the inertial coordinate system. And APZ is now in place of AP true. So only transforming that component of APZ into the inertial coordinate system for the maneuver, being true to the maneuver limitations of our pursuer. Preserving the true pronav command through the maneuver of the vehicle is a challenge in implementing pronav guidance laws. You can read more about that in the references at the end of this discussion. Now finally, pure pronav. In pure pronav, the pure pronav command is perpendicular to the pursuer velocity vector. So it's already aligned along the maneuver direction. So we simply resolve AP pure in the inertial coordinate system through the DCM involving lambda, lead angle, and heading air. That's the angle between the pursuer coordinate system and the inertial coordinate system. So therefore, AP pure is preserved in this implementation. Here are some useful references pertaining to this information. In this module, we developed the kinematic equations necessary to simulate engagements with proportional navigation. This is Missile Guidance Fundamentals, Section 3, Module 2.